Hello there everyone and welcome to another episode in the PowerShell video series. This video is essentially part 2 of the last video, and we're getting closer and closer to having mastered the whole object system in PowerShell. And we're also getting closer to the very last episode, where we will make an entire graphical app with buttons and everything right from PowerShell. It's going to be pretty exciting, but we need to understand how this stuff really works before we can get there. Now, one thing I'd just like to say before we move on. For this video, I'm going to change things up a little bit. Instead of directly using the PowerShell window like this, I'm actually instead going to be using an app available for Windows called Windows Terminal. It basically just slightly changes the interface you use to interact with PowerShell. It's still PowerShell, it's still all exactly the same commands and all of that, it just looks a little different and a little nicer. Now then, let's quickly summarise what we learnt in the last video. We learned that we have types, every object has a specific type, and that type says what properties and methods the object will have on it. So whenever we have an object telling us about a process, that object has the type process, and as such has all the members needed to represent a process. And of those members, we have properties, note properties, and most importantly, methods. Methods being the thing we learnt about last episode that allow us to perform actions on an object. Now, towards the end of the last episode, we called our first method, a method called getType. And as I said, this method appears on every type of object in existence, and it gives back, it returns, a type object that tells us all about what type the object is. So if I call get type on a string type of object, this method will give me back a type object telling me all about the string type. This type object also has some methods, methods that will retrieve even more details about the type. For example, towards the end of the last episode, we ran a method called get properties. This is a method that type objects have on them, and it will give us back a bunch of property info objects one for each property, and this is a very nice way to get a list of all the properties in an object. There's also a method called getMethods that will get us a list of all the methods in the type. So we can do something like this. We have a file object, we then run getType on that file object to get info about its type, and we then run getProperties on that type object to get a list of all the properties in the type. And that's how we find out what properties a file object has, and a similar thing happens for methods. Now then, I want to kick this episode off with parameters in methods, because we haven't actually used them yet. So let's take a look at the method that has a parameter. We're going to take a look at the moveTo method on file info objects. This method does not give back anything, but it takes in one parameter. And that parameter is the new place we want to move the file, so it's the new name we want to give the file. This parameter is set to take in a string, so we can only put a string into this parameter, only the text to the new file name we want to give it. So, if I had a file object for the file abc.txt, and I wanted to rename that file to def.txt, I could get a file object for the abc.txt, and I could then run this method, and put def.txt into the new name parameter. So let's do that. Here we are in PowerShell, in our new Windows Terminal host, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to take our file object here, for the file abc.txt, and I'm going to call the method moveTo on it. Now, as I said before, this method takes in a parameter, so how do we tell it what to put in that parameter? Well, what we do is we write what we want to put into the parameter inside the brackets. That's actually what the brackets here represent. Inside the brackets is where you tell it what you want each parameter to be. The reason why we left the brackets empty back when we were running getType is getType didn't have any parameters, so we just wrote the brackets and didn't put anything in them. But this method has one parameter, the new name parameter, and if we try to run it without setting that parameter, without putting anything within the brackets, we'll get an error like so. This ever says that it can't find an overload for move to with the argument count, argument count is another way of saying parameter count, of zero. So, in simpler terms, it's basically saying, 
I can't find a move to method that takes in zero parameters, which is how we're trying to run it here because we left the brackets empty. So instead of leaving the brackets empty, let's provide that parameter. Now methods are a little different to commands. If I have a command like import csv and I want to provide something to the path parameter, I write import csv and then I do dash path and give it the path here. So we choose what to put in each parameter based on their names. However, parameters on methods are based on order. So instead of writing dash path or dash new name or anything, I put in the parameter just like that. Done. My file is now called def.txt. So that's how we give parameters to methods. All right, but now, what if I have a method with two parameters? How do I tell it those two parameters? Well, let's see. Let me give you an example of a method that takes in two parameters. So on the string type, the type for text, there's a method called replace. This method replaces a certain thing in the string with another thing and gives back the result. For example, if I have the string a comma b, I can use this method to tell it to replace the comma with a dot. And when I do that, it will return back to me a string with the comma replaced by a dot. This method has two parameters. The first one is a string, and this is the text you want to replace. And the second one is also a string, and this is the text you want to replace it with. So essentially, if I put a comma in the first parameter, and then put a dot in the second parameter, that basically means replace the comma with a dot. So this method replaces every time the first parameter appears in the string with what's in the second parameter, and then gives the result back to us. It doesn't change the original string, it gives back a new thing with that replaced. So let's run this. Here we are in PowerShell, and I have the string a, comma, b. Now, I want to run replace on this to replace the comma with a dot. So, we're going to take this string object here, and we're going to do dot replace to run the method. And then we put in the brackets, and this is where we'll put the parameters. Now remember, this method has two parameters, and the way it knows what thing goes to what parameter is based on what order we give them in. Now for this method, the text to replace comes first, so we're going to give it a comma first. And now we need to give it the second parameter, what we want to replace the comma with. We've only given it the first parameter so far, but this method takes in two parameters. So if we run it now, you'll see we get the same error from earlier. This time saying it can't find any method called replace with only one parameter, because it takes in two. All we need to do is put a comma here, and then give it the second parameter. So if you look at this, we're giving it this string as the first parameter, and then we use a comma here to tell it that we're now moving on to the next parameter, and we give it the second parameter. And that's how it works. This is how you call a method with two parameters. You just separate each parameter with a comma, and the order you give them in is how it knows which thing goes to which parameter. And if we run it, we'll see that the method gave us back the string, but with the comma replaced by a dot. Amazing. And that's how we provide things to parameters. All right, let's move along to another important thing, and this will tie into the next thing I'm gonna cover. Every time I've told you about a method or property, I've had to manually say out what it takes in. I've said out loud, this method takes in two parameters. One is this and one is this. And I've said this method gives back something, this method doesn't, and so on. But how does PowerShell describe methods? There must be some formal written way that PowerShell describes methods, right? And there is. And what I'm going to do is quickly introduce you to it. Don't worry, it's very simple. And we're then going to take a look at something that use this written for. Now, the way we define, the way we show what a method is and what it gives back and what it takes in and all of that is using this writing here. First, we say what type of object the method returns. So what type of object it gives back to us. If it does not give back something, then we write void here. So this method here does not return anything. Then we say the name of the method. So in this case, it's called close. And then we follow that with brackets. And inside these brackets, if we had parameters, we would put them in there. That's it. So here's the getType method that we've used several times now. 
This is how we can describe the method. So we can see here that it returns, it gives back a type type of object, an object telling us about the type. And we can see that it's called get type. And we can see that there are no parameters because the brackets are empty. Okay, so how about what a method with a parameter looks like? This method returns a bool type of object, which is a true or false object. We'll learn more about these types in the next video. And we can see that this method is called wait for exit. And when we get to the brackets, we see this method has a parameter. And this parameter here is an integer. It takes in an integer and the parameter is called milliseconds. And if we have two parameters, all we do is just put a comma between them. So this method here has a string parameter called a and then an int parameter called b. Fantastic, so that's how we read method descriptions. So now, pause the video and tell me. Here's an imaginary method. How many parameters does this method have and what does it return? Well, you'll see here that it's a void, meaning it returns nothing. We get nothing back from this method. And over here, we'll see three parameters. We can tell there's three parameters because there's three things in between each of the commas. One here, one here, and one here. The first parameter takes in an int and it's called a, the second is called b and takes in an int, and the last is called c and takes in a date time object. And there you are. That is how we read method descriptions. Now, just a little off to the side, I know you may be wondering, where did this writing thing come from? Like, what is this strange way of describing methods that we're seeing here? Well, what you're seeing here is actually how you describe methods in the programming language C Sharp. When you want to make a new method in C Sharp, this is how you write it, and this is how you describe what parameters the method will have, and what the method's return type is, and all of that. So that's where this way of writing it comes from. And the reason why we're using C-sharp descriptions is because C-sharp is a programming language built on top of .NET, just like PowerShell, and is basically considered the definitive language for .NET. If you search up info about .NET types or methods, often it will be talking about them in a C-sharp context with C-sharp examples and such, because C-sharp is basically the definitive language for .NET. In fact, most of .NET itself, and most of PowerShell, is written in C Sharp. So all of those are reasons why that's the written form we use. Anyway, enough of that tangent. We also have a way of describing properties. And don't worry, it's just as easy. When you want to describe a property, first you put the type of object the property contains, then you put the name, and then this bit in the curly braces varies a little. When you see a get in here, that means you can look at what's in the property, and when you see a set in here, that means you can change what the property is set to. So in this case, the property has both a set and a get in the curly braces, meaning you can look at what's in it, and you can change what's in the property too. Sometimes you might see a property that doesn't have a set in it, and this means you can't change what's in it. You can only look at what it is. In other words, if there's no set, you can't set it, and therefore it's read-only. Anyway, why am I telling you about these things? Where do these descriptions actually appear? Well, let's hop into PowerShell and I'll show you. I'd like to introduce one of the last commands we're going to look at for the rest of this series. This command is called getMember, and the way you use it is very simple. You give it an object, and it gives a nice clear list of all the members it found on that object. If you give it loads of objects, it will give us the members of the first object it got. And this command is a fantastic way for us to get a nice clear list of what properties and methods are available on an object. Let me show you. So we're going to run get process, and then we're going to give the process objects to get member. And this tells get member, I want a list of all the members you see on the first object I give you. And there they are. So if we go to the top here, you'll see that for each one, we get the name, the member type, and the definition. And as we look through, you can see we have all of this stuff, alias properties and code properties, all the stuff we don't care about, and then we have some other stuff and all of that, but here are the methods. Here are all of the actions you can take on a process. So we could close the process, or kill the process, or close main window the process. There's lots of different methods for all the different actions you can take. 
And if we turn our attention over to the right, to the definition section, we can see that here, we're getting that C-sharp description I talked about earlier. So we can see that the closed method here, gives back nothing, because it says void, and it takes in no parameters. And if we go down here, we can see all the properties as well. So for example, the process name property, and we can see that it stores a string. It's called process name, and we can only get it. We can't change what it is. If we try to change what it is, we get an error. And that does make sense. You can't really change the name of a process while it's running. How does that even make sense? And yeah, so we get a nice list of all the members here. And we can go back up to the methods, and we can look at something like kill and look at its definition and... Wait a second. What's up with this definition? Wait, look, so we have one kill here, and then it talks about another kill? What's that about? Well, this brings me on to the last and final topic for this video. Methods can have different variants with different parameters. For example, remember the move to method on file objects from earlier? If you'll recall, that took in one string parameter, didn't it? Well, guess what? There's also a second variant of move to that takes in two parameters. One parameter for the new name, like we had in the first one, and a second parameter for whether we should overwrite an already existing file. So there are two variants of the move to method. When we run it with one parameter, it runs the first variant, and when we run it with two parameters, it runs the second. And there's a word for this. We call these overloads. The move to method has two overloads. One overload takes in one string parameter, while the other overload takes in a string parameter as well as a boolean parameter. This actually explains one of the words in the ever message we got earlier. Let's rewind back in time for a second. This ever says that it can't find an overload for move to. Remember that ever we got when we didn't give the method the right number of parameters? It said it can't find an overload, it can't find a variant of that method with that number of parameters. So now we truly understand that error from earlier. So, what we're seeing in here are those two variants, those two overloads of the method kill. I could run kill with no parameters, or if I'd like, I could also run it with this parameter. I can do whichever I like. Alright, so we're nearing the end of the video. There's just one trick I want to show you before I close it off. So let's say that here we have our process object with the kill method on it. And I want to get a list of all the different overloads we have available. Now, I could go through get member and go through and try and find the method deep within here and all of this. But there's also another way I can get a list of all the overloads of a method. Now, as we know, when we want to call a method, we always write the variable dot the method name and then brackets. These brackets are necessary to tell PowerShell we want to call the method. However, if we don't write the brackets, then PowerShell actually has a neat little feature where it will give us a list of all the overloads available, just like so. And you'll notice that it's telling me about the two different overloads I could do. This one, or this one. So yeah, that's quite nice. Anyway, we're nearing the end of the video. Now, I just want to go back really quickly to a command we haven't looked at in quite a while. Good old where, for filtering down objects to only ones that match a specific condition. As we'll remember, using it goes something like this, saying one thing equals another. One thing I don't think I ever fully explained, however, is what it actually does. How does this command actually work? We know how for each works, it runs the code that you give it once for each object it's given, substituting dollars underscore for that object, and if the block of code we give it returns something, it collects what it returned each time together. But what does where do? Well, where actually does a very similar thing. It runs this code we give it in the curly braces once for each of the objects we give it. But then what happens is each time it runs this block of code, it checks what that code gave back. And if this code returned the boolean object true, it adds that object into the result. And if it returns the boolean object false, then it does not add the object in. As you'll remember, a boolean is either true, meaning yes, or false, meaning no. So, say I have four objects like so, 
and I use dash like, which if you'll remember lets us compare using wildcards, what where does is it goes through each object one by one and runs the code we gave it, substituting dollars underscore for that object. And each time it does that, it looks at what our code returned. So, for the first one, it runs our code, but because it does not match, the code gives back the boolean object false. And because it gave false, where won't put this object into its result. Then we move on to the next one, and it runs the code we gave it again. And this time our code gave true, because the object did match. So where does allow that object into the result, and so on. So by the end, you'll have all the objects that matched in the output. That's what where does. It just runs the code we give it, and sees what it gives back. This condition here with the dash eq, I could write this outside where, and it will give me a boolean object true if it matches, and a boolean object false if it doesn't. Right now, there is no dollars underscore, so yeah, that's definitely going to give false, it's definitely not going to match. Also, since it's just code running inside the where, this also means I'm perfectly free to do absolutely whatever I like in there, as long as it gives back either true or false. Anyway, to close off the video, I have an interesting little task for you to try and do. Now, as you know, the command ls gives us a list of all the sub-files and sub-directories in our current folder. But, let's say that for some reason, I only want the sub-directories and not the sub-files. How would I do that? Well, the answer is actually quite simple. After a quick Google search, you'd find that all you need to do is write ls-directory, and this will give, well, only directories. However, a long, long time ago, PowerShell didn't actually have this parameter. We're talking a very long time ago here, not even the bundled version with Windows is anywhere near as old as that. But yeah, it didn't have it. So then comes the question, how could we have gotten a list of just directories without this parameter to do it for us? Well, there are actually a few ways. There's a property we can check that gives it away, and a few other things. But since we've been learning about types lately, how about, just for practice, we see if we can use our knowledge about types to do it. Now, in reality, what we're about to do, you would never actually do because, well, there's a parameter right there to do it for us. But just for the sake of practice and really getting up close to the objects and their types, let's see if we can filter it down to just directories ourselves based on the types. I want to show you something interesting here. So here's the output of ls one folder and one file as you can see and what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna ask powershell to tell us what type each of these objects are so we'll have a for each and we'll get the type on each object we did this towards the end of the last episode if you'll remember and if we take a look you'll see something interesting whenever we have a directory the object to represent that directory is a directory info type of object, whereas whenever we have a file, the object to represent that file is a file info type of object. Now, I wonder if we can use this to filter down to only directories. So, here's my idea, and here's what I want you to try and do. What we're going to do is we're going to run ls, and we're then going to say where objects type is directory info. Now, I'll admit that this is actually a very hard task, so I honestly would not be surprised if you struggle to do it. Just before you go and try it, however, the full name of directory info is system.io.directoryInfo. That's its full name. And if you ever want to perhaps refer to the type directory info, you need to write out this full name. Just thought that was worth mentioning. Now, there's actually a few ways of doing this, so just try and do whatever comes to your mind, somehow using the type of each object to, to allow you to filter it out. With that said, that's all I'll say. Go ahead and try it. And if you get stuck, which you probably will because this is a very hard task, I'll give you a tip. Remember, you need to write the full name if you ever want to get the type object for the directory info. Alright, here's my tip. It's going to look something like this. And inside this where, on the left of the equals, we want to get the type of the object we're currently checking. And on the right, we want to get the type directory info. So that way, we're literally saying where the type of the current object equals the type directory info. 
If you still get stuck, that's fine, and I'll give you another tip. All right, my final tip. In order to get the type of the current object in the where, there's a certain method we can run that will get the type. And on the right of the equals, in order for us to get the type directory info to compare with, there's a certain square bracket thing we can use. All right, here's what it will look like. We're going to get all the files and folders in here, and we're going to use where to filter them down to only the ones where their type equals the type system.io.directory info, just like so. And that is how you could do it. Of course, you wouldn't do this because there's a parameter to do it for you, but the more time you spend looking at the things and trying to achieve things, the better you get. Practice makes perfect after all, and that's really the lesson to be learned in life. Anyway, enough of my motivational speech. If you look in the description, I have another task you can try if you'd like, and I'll see you all next time, where we're going to look at some important types that you should know about, as well as how to work with them and much more beyond that. And with that said, bye.